folks can please start taking their seats. We want to get started at precisely um, 10 after. Let's get started. Please take your seats. It's it's my it's my pleasure to introduce Ralph Izzo, Chairman, President, and CEO of Public Service Enterprise Group, PSEG. So we've got our second utility. Ralph was elected Chairman and CEO of PSEG in. 2007 and was named the company's president, CEO, and member of the board in 2006. He's well-known and highly respected leader within the utility industry as well as in the public policy arena. He's frequently asked to testify before Congress and speak to organizations on matters pertaining to national energy policy. In my research for the introduction, I learned about how the company is helping consumers invest in the grid, how and how he believes it's cheaper to make new nuclear power plants economic than to get rid of them. Mr. Izu has also called for a national price on carbon and describes how nuclear power is a tale of two stories, regulated and unregulated. So touching up some, uh, some of that on his, in his remarks. Mr. Izzo is the chair of the nuclear energy industry, NEI, and serves on the board of directors for the New Jersey Cha Chamber of Commerce the Edison Electric Institute, the Nuclear Electric Institute Limited, and the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. He probably serves as many other boards that I'm not aware of. So with that, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Ralph. Thank you and good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And tell you a little bit about PSEG, Public Service Enterprise Group. I'll begin with the obligatory non, uh, disclaimer statements. I, I won't read them to you, but I do refer you to the presentation. I will be making some forward-looking statements, and I will be using uh, some non-GAAP terminology uh, as well. But a little bit about PSEG, for those of you who aren't uh, quite as familiar with this, we basically are constituted by two operating companies. One is a regulated electric and gas utility and the other is a competitive power generation business. And as you heard, that competitive power generation business is about 55, 60% uh, nuclear in its output. I'll go into greater detail about the assets associated with each of these businesses. Here we just quote you some financial statistics as of the end of 2018. Uh, the net effect of these statistics are, are that we are one of the 100 or so companies who claim to be among the 10 largest in the industry. Uh, we each have our own metric that we use to, to, to determine what uh, constitutes size. In terms of where most of our assets are located, our service territory is, uh, to the, for those of you who are somewhat familiar with New Jersey, uh, the, the New Jersey Turnpike, and a few miles east and west of that. It's that uh, non-green section of the map that you see behind me, uh, and then you just see some of our uh, transmission systems. So not a very extensive, from the point of view of number of miles, but given the high population density of the state in New Jersey, we do serve a little over 2 million electric customers and a little under 2 million gas customers. We also operate the system of the Long Island Power Authority, not shown here on the map, but that's another million electric customers out on Long Island in, uh, in New York State. Also, what we try to show here is the location of our power plants. We have about 13,000 megawatts under operational control, the vast majority of them in the PJM system. We have a couple of plants in New England, uh, specifically Connecticut, and one in uh, New York State. Both of those are ga natural gas combined cycle units. And we have about 600 megawatts of solar scattered around the country uh, as well. So let's just talk about our past and our future as, as we see it. At least the first 100 years of the company's 116 years of history were really about building out the infrastructure, primarily the integrated infrastructure from the power plant to the home and making sure that universal access to electricity and natural gas was indeed being provided. 
that was a monumental task, and I don't mean to, to understate its significance, but I don't think you want to hear me uh, regale you about our history. Rather, uh, let's take a look at what's happening more recently and what tomorrow will bring. The past 10 years, we've been a little bit of an industry in the process of a nervous breakdown as the, as the uh, supply piece has been completely deregulated. And in some respects, the transmission component has been deregulated. But the wire into the premise is still largely viewed as a natural monopoly service. And in fact, not only has there been this change within the industry, but that change has been compounded by the fact that it has been different in different parts of the country. So in our northeast mid-Atlantic part of the country, the deregulation of the wholesale power market has been taken very, very seriously. In other parts of the country, it still remains part of the integrated whole. But most importantly, let's look beyond 2019. But before we do that, I have a little quiz for everyone here. And it's not a test of your knowledge. It's a test of your honesty. And no one has ever failed it. So by a show of hands, how many of you woke up this morning and honestly said, I cannot wait to use a kilowatt hour? <laughs> OK, all right. So I had one smart aleck in the college audience who raised his hand and just wanted to throw me for a loop, and he did. Uh, so, so I check our stock price about every 45 seconds. And I did not wake up this morning wondering whether or not I could really use as many kilowatt hours as conceivable. So as we look to the future, we see that the first and foremost, the number one priority for us as an infrastructure company, allowing people to use a product that is essentially a means to an end, and a product that they really could care less about that means only to the extent it interferes with the end, is to help them use less of it. That is our number one priority. You really don't care about that kilowatt hour, but you do want to make sure the lights are on when you're walking down the stairs in the dark on a winter morning so that you don't break your neck. You may really care about whether or not the power will be in the home when you want to watch that program tonight on television or read that book with the light by your nightstand. So this three-part future, and we do see three primary characteristics of this future, the number one part of that is energy efficiency. And it is the least least attention of, of all of the three parts that we see talked about uh, in public policy circles today. Now, the reality is, if you just fall back on your basic physics, we cannot efficient our way to a zero supply future. That no matter how good we get at reducing the amount of energy we consume, uh, we will still need to be supplied by some form of electricity. And we do think that that needs to be cleaner than ever before. And cleanliness is no longer simply determined by ozone, mercury, and traditional pollutants. It is increasingly determined by carbon dioxide. And we still have a way to go. A recent Stanford study where Americans were polled as to whether or not they believe climate change was real surprisingly revealed that between 75 and 78% of Americans believe climate change is real. And that was almost independent of location. Yes, Californians and people in Kentucky and people in New Jersey and people in Illinois roughly feel the same way about whether or not climate change is a real threat. When asked the question, do you think your neighbor believes climate change is real, what do you think happened to that 75 to 78 percent? Absolutely. Yeah, someone in the front of the room just pointed down. Tumbled down to 43 percent. And that really decreases the impetus for action, right? Because even though I think it's important, nobody else does. So why do I waste my time trying to get people to act on this? It's sort of an indictment of where we are from a public policy circle, but one that we will uh, continue to work on. The second feature then, therefore, is to make sure that cleanliness includes carbon in its calculation. And we, have, as I mentioned a moment ago, are investing in solar. We, we are participating in an offshore wind solicitation in New Jersey. But, but far and away, the most important thing we can do to make sure that we don't reverse the progress we've made in terms of carbon minimization is to preserve the existing nuclear fleet. Absent a price on carbon, absent some advances in nuclear technology, we're, we're not investors in new nuclear, but we are firm believers that the existing 20% of electricity that's generated in the nation by nuclear, representing 60% of the carbon-free generation, is an essential point of rapid decarbonization. And last but not least, as we reduce the amount of energy that's used for today's purpose, and as we clean up the supply of energy that's used for that reduced amount, we need to then electrify the rest of the economy, which will greatly increase the importance of making the grid as reliable and as resilient as it can possibly be. And we'll talk about more of these in detail as we go forward. Uh, we're fortunate as a company that that public policy description that I've tried to 
uh, uh, draws a backdrop to our vision of the future of our company is one that is completely consistent with where the current administration in the state of New Jersey is going, both in terms of its renewable and clean energy targets for the future and its expectations for reduction in energy consumption, both at the electric and gas side. I have here listed six elements of what that future will look like, and I'll go through each of them in detail. But, but as I mentioned a moment ago, it begins with energy efficiency and then moving clockwise around the diagram, preserving nuclear, investing in solar and offshore wind, making sure the storage capacity is there to help utilize uh, to maximum effectiveness the intermittent nature of solar and wind, and then uh, tackling what has become the number one source of carbon, certainly in New Jersey and I believe in many other parts of the country, uh, that being our transportation system. So what exactly does this look like? Uh, we are proposing over the next five years, and we're asking over the next five years, to invest $2.5 billion in energy efficiency. It is the single biggest investment request that we are making of our regulators. Uh, I call this the quadruple win. There are two that are rather obvious. Number one is the fact that customer bills go down. Number two is the fact that the environment improves. But number three is that under the right regulatory system, if we view ourselves as an infrastructure company, I'm indifferent as to whether or not that infrastructure is a programmable thermostat or a transformer. Yes, it takes a lot of programmable thermostats to make up for a transformer, but I have a lot of customers. So I can do that and make my shareholders quite happy. And number four, one that's often not discussed, is that this is a very labor-intensive part of the energy uh, equation. And it's, it's a labor-intensive part that does not require a lot of training. So we can begin to appeal to a lot of non-traditional communities uh, to assist in, in doing this work. And by the way, the housing stock in some of our uh, urban areas uh, tends to be uh, the prime candidates for energy efficiency improvements. So you have a match between the non-traditional workforce and the location where the work needs to be done. Then you see a few hundred million dollars on electric vehicle infrastructure. If you were to pick the ideal state, the ideal location where electric vehicles should be, should be penetrating the market, you would want a state that's densely populated with short commutes, poor air quality and high per capita income. For those of you who are not familiar with it, I just described New Jersey for you. <laughs> and we are 48 out of 48 states in electric vehicle penetration. It's, it, that may not be exactly right, but we are pathetic. We lag Georgia, we lag California, we lag New York, we lag a bunch of people. And it appears to be around range phobia, the, the phenomenon that, you, that you've heard uh, often spoken of. We've talked about being the one that just creates the infrastructure to eliminate that range phobia and recognizing that this is not a natural monopoly service at the time that the market begins to take over we would back away and the back away mechanism is very simple we would sell the infrastructure take those proceeds and return that money to the customers who have uh, made the initial investment through us the area that I'm most interested in is the energy cloud here I do know that New Jersey is 48 out of the lower 48 states in advanced metering infrastructure uh, I envy Nick and some of his territories that have been able to do that. Uh, this whole ability to get more granular data around customer usage and then be able to apply data analytics to those consumption patterns really can help us avoid the typical customer behavior of run to failure, whether it's the refrigerator, the air conditioning system, the heating system, or the light bulb. Running to failure is a highly inefficient way to manage your household uh, energy needs, and uh, it's only through advanced metering infrastructure that one can get around that. Our system is fairly well diagnosed once you get above the secondary side to the power plant. So uh, AMI is less of an issue for us there and, uh, and, and just more of an issue in terms of uh, enriching the customer experience. So when I take a look then at uh, so much for energy efficiency, now let's take a look at cleaning supply. Uh, here we show a picture of where our solar farms are. It's about 600 megawatts nationwide. I think the area that we're most proud of though is that in New Jersey, which is blessed by Bruce Springsteen, the Jersey Shore, and various other things. One thing we are not blessed by is an abundance of land or sunshine. What we've tried to do is reclaim old industrial sites and landfills to make sure that land that is really not of any high value use can then uh, be turned into something that's uh, quite a bit more valuable. And we've successfully done that at a fairly high cost. I don't want to get away from that. As somebody who in 1978 as a senior in college did his thesis on solar-powered air conditioning because it was only three years away from commercial feasibility. I've had a lifelong love of solar, but I worry about the, uh, the, the misleading statements that some folks make about how the sunshine being free and ignore the fact that converting it to electricity in some parts of the nation could be downright expensive, New Jersey being one of those places. 
Uh, preserving our nuclear plants, I don't have a slide on that, but that, that would have been and is our number one method of uh, making sure that the progress we're making on carbon uh, is not reversed by loss of that. There was a question asked earlier about adaptation uh, to, to uh, climate change, and Superstorm Sandy was our, our life-changing experience in the Mid-Atlantic region in 2012, October 28th to be exact, a day that will live in my mind forever. It was followed by two weeks of conversations with various people, the President of the United States, the Secretary of Energy, the Governor of New Jersey, Assistant Secretaries of the Department of Energy. Uh, and I'll never forget some of the most poignant moments. I, you know, President Obama has no reason to remember the conversation with me, but I, with a handful of my peers in the industry, did speak with him on one occasion. Uh, two days into the, into the disaster, I remember being with one of my uh, operation leads in our emergency response center. And, he received a phone call in a cell that was identified as a local hospital. He immediately answered it, worried that it might have been an employee. But it turned out to be a surgeon who, who reported to him that he had to do several elective uh, surgeries that day, uh, 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 heart surgeries. And he had heard on the, in the newspapers and in the radio that we were actively trying to restore critical loads first. And he couldn't understand why a hospital wasn't a critical load, this being two or three days into the disaster. And we assured him that it was a critical load and we would get them back today and he wouldn't have to do these surgeries on, on backup uh, diesel generators. So I had, speaking to the president about the concern over the petrochemical industry and the refiners, uh, refineries coming back online to be able to supply gasoline to the, to the East Coast, speaking to this cardiologist that day. And then about two weeks into the storm, I received an email from a very thoughtful customer who said that I've been seeing every day in the newspapers and in the radio and TV how hard your employees are working to restore power. And I'm very grateful for all that you've done for others. But if you don't get my power back on today, I am sending my teenager to live with you. <laughs> and, and I tell that story not to get the, the usual giggles, but because whether it was the President of the United States on the day the storm hit or that cardiologist two days later or that stay-at-home parent two weeks later, they were at wit's end. They really were worried. So as I speak about reducing energy use from its traditional uh, consumption patterns and then improving the cleanliness of the supply so that we can electrify the economy, if you think people are grumpy because they can't charge their cell phone today, wait until they can't use their car tomorrow because a storm has come through and they are out of power for two weeks. So resiliency is a critical aspect of our investments in New Jersey, both in terms of a 100-year-old gas pipe system that leaks methane, and many of you, I'm sure, know that methane is a 30x contributor to the greenhouse effect compared to CO2, and in terms of our electric infrastructure. New Jersey is one of the original 13 colonies, and if you remember, uh, industrial growth occurred typically along transportation corridors. Yes, in the old days, transportation corridors were waterways, and uh, that then followed by rail lines along those waterways. And guess where our electric infrastructure is located? In low-lying waterway regions. So we've had to physically lift our infrastructure uh, to, to, to be able to uh, anticipate uh, the increasing effects of climate change. In terms of our carbon intensity, as I go back about 13 years, I, I, I don't know why we went back 13 years. We could have gone 15 years. We could have gone 12 years. There's no magic here. Uh, we're, we've always been lower by about 40% in terms of our carbon emissions than PJM and the national average. The national average is the purple triangle uh, diamonds on the top line, and PJM is the blue triangles. That would be our competitive market region. It used to be Pennsylvania, Jersey, and Maryland. It's now 13 states. I'm not going to recite them for you. Uh, but you can see that we've further declined, uh, even from that uh, historically low level to about 43%. And, uh, and we're, we're proud of that track record. It was really done in two ways. One was by increasing the output of our nuclear plants, and two is decreasing the output of our coal plants. Zero credit to yours truly or our company for decreasing the output from our coal plants, purely driven by economics. So during this era, the nation and we as a company reduced our carbon output for zero environmental reasons. And that is so important to understand, because if you look at our last data point as a company, you see that little orange dot that went up? That's not because people use more. This is per unit megawatt hour. That's because we shut all our coal plants in the year before. So as, as, as we have gone through an eight to 10 year period of shale gas shaking out the uneconomic coal assets, we're now at a point where we're at fairly much of an equilibrium. I don't expect natural gas to drop below 2, 250 in MMBTU. And therefore, the 
efficient coal plants that can compete with those prices of natural gas are, are still on the market. So what you're going to see going forward is CO2 emissions going up in the absence of a price on carbon or some environmental motivation to do less. So we should not fool ourselves to say that we've been so wonderful in reducing our carbon emissions over the past few years because it has largely been driven by the economic imbalance between low-cost natural gas and higher-cost alternative fuels. The one offset to that will be continued aggressiveness on the part of states through their renewable portfolio standards. But we will have to change the whole view of the cost of commodities if we want to continue the kind of progress we've seen in the past 10 years in carbon emissions. So I've talked a lot about uh, some high-level stuff. I'm going to bore you with uh, one or two slides on, on details about how we operate as a company. Our ocean incident rate is how frequently do people get hurt. We typically do better than average and among the best 25% in, in, in the industry. SADI stands for System Average Interruption Duration Index. What on earth is that? Think of it as the product of two numbers. How often do you lose power and how long are you out for? We typically are among the top 10% in the nation. Uh, Top 10%, don't get that wrong, with few, fewest amount of outage, right? So, so that works out well. And then our JD Power Electric Residential and Gas Residential always puts us in the top quartile of the nation. If, we, if I think about some financial metrics for, uh, for the investors that are, are interested in some of the more recent data, you can see as recently as five years ago, we were a little, we were about half and half competitive power generation, half competitive utility. Then when we spent about three quarters of our capital program and directed it towards the utility, things like uh, grid resiliency, some solar investments, some energy efficiency, not as much as we would like to have done. That helped change the mix of earnings in the company to about 75% utility, 25% competitive power generation. I must be honest with you, that was done in two ways. One was the investments in the utility that helped improve the earnings of the utility, but then the lower price of natural gas crush the earnings of the power generation business, right? So that's the part we don't boast about as uh, uh, t t too often. So, so the growth in the utility was, was uh, met with some decline in the power generation business. When you add the two of them up, though, you could see the overall earnings went from about $2.58 a share to $3.25 a share at the midpoint of our guidance this year. Perhaps more importantly, as I look to the future, we have 90 to 94 percent of our investments going towards the utility, which will be those energy efficiency investments, the electric vehicle investments, and the grid resiliency investments that I spoke about a moment ago. Uh, we've paid a dividend every year for 112 years. Uh, the growth rate has been about three, three and a half percent over the past 10 years. As you can see, back in 2009, when gas prices were screaming and the power business was making a ton of money, our dividend exceeded the earnings of our utility. So the blue bar is the dividend payout per share. The green line is the utility earnings. Uh, because of that dependency, therefore, on, on the earnings of the less predictable power generation business, we grew that dividend rather slowly in those years. But as we moved towards more of a regulated mix, with a much more stable earnings profile, we've been able to increase the pace at which we've been growing the, the, uh, the dividend payout ratio. And now you can see the utility is comfortably above the, uh, uh, the dividend payout ratio. So we've made a lot of investments. We've been growing our rate base at seven to nine. We, we plan to grow our rate base at seven to nine percent. We have grown our rate base at double digit. We've grown the utility earnings at double digit. We have a dividend that's growing at four percent. Who on earth is paying for all of this? It must be the customer. And here is our source of greatest pride. Over the past 10 years, in nominal terms, the customer's bill has gone down by 30 percent. And in real terms, the customer's bill has gone down by 40 percent. A very small part of that is the fact that our O&M, our cost structure, has gone up on an average basis over these 10 years by 0 percent. But before I start selling you snake oil, the number one reason that this has happened is two words, shale gas. Okay. So we are public service enterprise group. Our, electric, our, our utilities, public service electric and gas, that G is responsible for that 40 and 30 percent reduction. Uh, in terms of the customer bill. There's been a tremendous decline in the cost of natural gas for customers, and that has allowed us to invest in the infrastructure in a way that we would not have been able to before. It's a partnership we develop with our regulators that they're fully aware of, they're fully knowledgeable about, they're fully cognizant of, uh, and our argument has simply been that this consumer dividend, this low interest rate environment screams, let's replace an aging infrastructure and let's invest in ways that we haven't done before. 
The markets recognize that. I would argue that on a risk-adjusted basis, we've outperformed the S&P 500 uh, in each of the last year, the last three years, and the last five years. Uh, we've done it on an absolute term in a one- and five-year period, but uh, I would say on a risk-adjusted basis on the three-year period. And also in terms of utility indices, certainly the broadest measure of that being the S&P 500 utility index we've outperformed over those time frames as well. Uh, the Dow Jones we have not outperformed over the past year, but over the three- and five-year period we have. I'm not going to spend any time on the other very important dimensions of sustainability, uh, but corporate citizenship for a utility means everything. One cannot pick up your wires and your power plants and your customers and move them somewhere else. So being a partner with public policy makers is, is, is critically important. Transparency and disclosure is not something we've been really good at, and that is my fault only. I've always operated under the assumption that you cannot talk your way out of a situation you behaved your way into. But in today's social uh, uh, media market, in today's rapid era of communication, I am increasingly finding that we have to tell people what we've been doing. We are very proud of what we have done. We are very proud of what we are about to do. But I've never thought it was so important to make sure that we told everyone through every medium possible as to what we were doing, because they would just find out for themselves if they took the time. So we are increasing our disclosure around political contributions, carbon emissions, uh, diversity and inclusion, and a myriad of other issues. Diversity and inclusion is not a good thing to do for us. It is an absolute necessity. New Jersey is the most diverse state in America, and most of our hiring comes from, the, from New Jersey and the area, and of course, you know about the diversity of New York. So I would, I would direct you to our website and our sustainability report there, which we no longer print. Uh, for, for information on that. Now this is probably the first time you will see a slide like this. I'm going to boast about my board of directors. So I, I, I am blessed with 13,000 incredibly talented employees, but I'm also blessed with 10 members of a board of directors who are experienced, who are diverse, and who are committed. They range from former CEOs to university presidents, from would-be Nobel Prize winners uh, to, uh, to just incredibly smart business people. And I just realized you can't possibly read that, but hopefully we'll distribute these slides and you'll see what it is that I'm talking about. So with that, you know, we have one slide and we, we can all, uh, in addition to being one of the 100 utilities that are among the 10 largest, we have no shortage of opportunities to, to self-congratulate ourselves and we do it all the time as an industry. We probably do it only second to the, uh, uh, to the entertainment business. But we have been frequently recognized for the way in which we treat our customers, our employees, and our shareholders through a myriad of different uh, different recognitions. And with that, I think I will stop and thank you for your patience and listening and uh, open for questions. Questions? Uh, Tim Yeomans. Uh, thank you. Uh, Tim Yeomans, Hermes EOS, uh, here on behalf of our uh, 30 clients that are investors around the world. Some of them are listening. Uh, Chairman Nizzo, good to see you again. Um, so you're banking on efficiency in big time. In your capital allocation, uh, the vast majority of that going out to 2023 is involved in that. It seems like your customers, key stakeholders, have to be a big part of that equation. Um, you know, we're the leading investor in something called the Climate Action 100, um, a list that you're not on because of your great leadership. Uh, how, though, in your board, in your governance oversight of this, and governance is a key part of climate leadership, uh, does the efficiency fit in to your governance? You have a, a, you know, a le industry leading fossil fuel committee on the board, you have an industry leading nuclear committee on the board, but how does this huge investment in energy efficiency fit into your governance? Uh, methodology. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thanks for the question, Tim. So what we've decided as a board is that uh, through the energy efficiency investments that we want to make, we are willing to cannibalize our power generation business. We are not, however, willing to cannibalize the uh, investments we've made in the, the grid. That is largely a fixed cost business. So therefore, we have said to the regulators, look, we'll do this knowing that we are going to be harming 25 percent of our business but you must allow us to recover our fixed costs that we will lose through these volumetric sales. Uh, for those of you who are more familiar with the industry, there are mechanisms used in 30 states. They all go under the name of decoupling, uh, which, which we are advocates of. And I don't, I don't think uh, there'll be disappointment uh, on the part of some of our partners, such as 
Natural Resources Defense Council, Environmental Defense Fund. These are national, credible environmental organizations that are shoulder to shoulder with us arguing for uh, those changes in regulation in New Jersey. So from a governance point of view, what we've said is we will compromise this part of the business, but we won't compromise that, and the way to do that is through decoupling. Uh, Bruce Piasecki, founder of the AHC Group. Uh, very uh, thoughtful, and uh, we work for Merck and other companies okay. in the New Jersey area. So everything you said about New Jersey is so clear. How many feet did you lift the infrastructure? And I asked that question. Uh, we were involved recently in a DOD uh, project where places like Tyndall right. Air Force Base needs hundreds of millions right. to be restored for combat readiness over the next there's 71 sites like that. So anything you could tell us about the expense and the footage right. and what you did right. for coastal issues would be very useful. Yes, so I, I, I could have and I should have pointed out more clearly, but in the slide presentation where I was talking about resiliency, there were some before and after pictures, you may not have noticed, uh, of some work we had done uh, that was post Sandy. And unfortunately, bad weather didn't stop after Sandy. Nothing quite as horrific as Sandy. And you would have seen that there was still a substation that was underwater because we hadn't finished the work. But part of it was above water because we had finished the work there. So, so the short answer to your question is anywhere from 6 to 18 inches, depending upon where it was located. And public service? Completely supportive of it. Yes, they were. So we, we did something called Energy Strong, which was a $1.2 billion program to lift 29 substations off the ground. And by the way, many times, you know, we. Look, my background is technology, and I love getting it, uh, throwing around data analytics and, and predictive analysis and Internet of Things and all sorts of whatever uh, urban uh, literature we, we want to embrace. But if we could get customers to caulk their windows and change the setting on their thermostat when they go to bed at night, we'd be in great shape. And many times resiliency is lifting equipment six inches off the ground or 12 inches off the ground. So it's not, uh, th there's a lot that can be done to improve both the way in which we use energy and the resiliency of the grid that does not depend upon uh, path-breaking uh, technology developments. Ah, so how would a federal infrastructure program, particularly in the tri-state area, impact our plans? Are you lobbying for it? Also, Bruce or Bon Jovi? So, so the, I'll take the, the harder one first. Uh, Bruce, 18 times, I'm totally embarrassed to admit it, 18 of his concerts. Uh, but I've, I've never met Bruce, and I've met Bon Jovi, so I'm, I'm weakening. Uh, so so uh, if, I, if I continue to meet Bon Jovi and don't meet Bruce, hopefully, Bruce, you're one of the 1,000 people listening on this webcast, <laughs> uh, that we, we can change that. Uh, boy, I could tell you Bruce stories that, that, never mind. So in terms of the federal infrastructure program, I think most of the federal infrastructure program being talked about is trans for our region is transportation and tunnels. So uh, we don't have a lot of infrastructure in those in those cross huts and tunnels or in uh, the, the, the actual coastal part of the New Jersey shore. So that won't have a big impact on us. Uh, our infrastructure needs uh, won't come from FEMA or the federal government. They will really be funded mostly by New Jersey residents. Other questions? I, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, what did you mean by when you said nuclear power is the tale of two stories, regulated or uh, so, so for those of you who are not as familiar with the way in which uh, utilities are economically regulated, when you have an asset, if, it was, if the expense was prudently incurred, you're allowed to collect rates such that you uh, recover what you spent on that asset and you earn a return on that asset, and thus we, we call it rate-based rate of return. Uh, for those of us who are no longer have our power plants in that market, in that, in that paradigm, uh, we get paid what the market's willing to bear. So the way in which m most competitive power markets are designed is you get paid for your energy on a short-run marginal cost basis under the premise that if I make a penny today, I live to fight another day tomorrow. So uh, natural gas selling at $2 an MMBTU in our part of the country uh, with a modern-day efficient natural gas plant is about... 7,000 BTUs per kilowatt hour. If you do the arithmetic, that means that energy prices can be uh, sometimes as low as $14. They, they, 
per, per, kilo, uh, per megawatt hour. They tend to be higher than that. They, that. That's just sort of an extreme case. But a nuclear plant, which has much lower cost fuel, typically has a much larger staff to operate it. And the inframarginal, so, so a nuclear plant will cost $7 a megawatt hour. So the difference between that 14 and that 7 is supposed to pay for your people, and it doesn't. Uh, so so that's, what, that's the tale of two cities. So in, in a regulated world, you'd get recovery of, of those operating expenses. In a deregulated world, it's whatever your competition allows you to charge. And our competition, number one competition now is natural gas. Both you and Nick spoke about really the incredible power of efficiency that consumers may have in terms of the whole energy world. That we've had some great benefit over the last few years uh, because of shale gas, which has helped bring prices down. Is there industry efforts, campaigns, et cetera, that help to drive that, the caulking that you mentioned, et cetera? So, so there are, they're mostly state by state. EEI is trying to get out in front of this issue to a greater extent. And some states are really good at it, and some states are not so good at it. Uh, you know, we, we, we don't spend $7 billion a year. We spend about $3 billion a year in terms of our capital program. Over the last 10 years, we've spent $400 million in energy efficiency. It's pathetic. Uh, the way in which most states approach energy efficiency is they don't view it as a natural monopoly service, which it is not. But by the same token, they, they don't embrace the recognition that there are a lot of well-understood, well-identified market imperfections that get in the way of, a, of, of people investing in energy efficiency. You know, the simplest one is the recognition that, on average, we spend 2 to 3% of our disposable income on energy. So if you are a high net worth individual, that number is probably a little bit lower, because it doesn't scale with the size of the house, per se. But you are exactly the type of person that can go in and look at these two air conditioning systems and say, I'll buy the more efficient one, if you care. But if it's such a small part of your, uh, of your expense, you tend to not care. So that compromises the number of people who can make the, the investment who do make the investment. On the other hand, if you're a low net worth individual, it's not two to three percent, it's a much bigger number. Now you really need to make that energy efficiency investment, but when you go to buy that efficient refrigerator, you look at it and you gag at the price. So you need it, but you can't do it. So that's just one simple example. Then you have, of course, agency issues. Well, I'm not the landlord, I don't own this property, why should I do it? You have opportunity cost issues. You talk to a hospital president who is out of his mind or her mind for not making the energy efficiency investment, and they'll turn around and say, well, if I've got a million dollars to spend, it is not gonna be on a boiler, because people aren't gonna choose my hospital on the basis of kilowatt hours consumed per square foot. They're gonna choose my hospital on the basis of the quality of the medical care, which means I'm gonna invest in medical equipment and people and such. So, so you've got this tension between is it a natural monopoly service, is it not? W will the market ever deliver it? The, the answer appears to be no. So what do we do? We create grant programs, and the grant programs give people 20%, 30%, 40% discounts for buying energy efficiency equipment. I tested the New Jersey grant program. I could not fathom that I would be eligible for an energy efficiency grant from the state of New Jersey. And, and I did, I bought a, my wife and I bought an efficient uh, washer dryer and I got a hundred dollar check from people whose economic means are not mine to pay for that. Right? And it's like, this is crazy. We, we have regressive programs that are grant based going to the wrong people. Uh, and, and as Nick and I are very proud to talk about the universal access element of our industry. Well, first it was universal access to get that meter and that wire. I'd like it to be universal access now to energy efficiency. Oh, my favorite, yeah. Okay, so my favorite Bruce album is a tie between Born to Run and uh, Darkness, because I just remember driving in the car with the windows open, listening to both of those. <laughs> and then, who can replicate that? And uh, wh what is my time? Which one do you want me to read this? The first, the, the first one. Can I share a little bit more about our plans for increased transparency and disclosures going forward and channels you, we will use to communicate them? Yes, yeah, so we are trying to assess the myriad of rating agencies or entities that have come out on ESG, uh, but candidly, uh, we, we've done a little bit of a scan and to the extent that we are rated by people, we have found that we are rated either, either, depending on who you believe, as sort of best in class or the worst thing that ever happened to the industry, So, and yet we're the same company. So w one of the things we're doing is we're trying to talk to these agencies about what kind of data they want to see put forward, how can we help them understand the things that we're trying to do. 
but if you'll, you'll beg my indulgence, I still want to believe that you cannot talk your way out of a situation you behaved your way into. And I would ask you to measure us not by so much what we say, but what, what we do. And, um, and then we'll keep trying to tell you what we do. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you.